Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and it's December 21st, the solstice, and it's time for another one of my news videos. And uh, yeah, once again, it's a day later than the previous one. I think I'm doing like an eight day cycle. I don't know, is that there's something like that living on Mars? I don't know. Anyway, uh, we're going to start, as usual, with the, the rocket launches of the week. And while I went uh, to press, so to speak, last week, just as a Chinese rocket was launching. That was successful. But since then, it's been a trio of Falcon 9s. Uh, so the first one was on Saturday morning, where there was a Falcon 9 launch with a Starlink batch from Vandenberg. And this was an interesting one because they actually were launching it to a 52 degree inclination, which meant hugging the coast down and, you know, getting over Baja, California. Uh, this was actually delayed 24 hours because I believe there was a LOX, I heard there was a LOX valve issue at the launch pad which delayed the test. But more interestingly, I think, is the fact that this is the first rocket, the first booster from SpaceX to break the all-important Tufnel barrier, as they say. That's right, this booster goes to 11. It's the 11th reflight of this. It had spent something like 200 days getting checked out uh, because it had previously flown 10 times. And uh, yeah, it looks like it's been successfully flown and recovered. Now, less than 24 hours later, on Saturday night, we had a Falcon 9 launching Turksat 5B from Florida. Now, this is a Turkish geocommunication satellite. It's been built by Airbus. Turkey is actually going to be built their own domestic satellite at some point, but... Uh, yeah, again, this launch, successful, had a wonderful landing, and the full moon actually showed us some cool details of the of the landing. You know, you could actually see the Earth at night, which is pretty, pretty neat. And just a few hours ago, we had the final Falcon 9 launch of the year, CRS-24 launching a Dragon cargo spacecraft to the ISS, carrying Christmas presents, which I understand includes lots of hot sauce, because they love that. Weather was a concern, but they managed to find a hole in the weather that synced up with the International Space Station. Launch was successful, recovery was successful, and this is the 100th recovery of a SpaceX Falcon 9 booster. And it happens on the 6th anniversary of their very first booster recovery. They've now recovered like uh, mo way more, like 75% or something of SpaceX's launches have had recovered boosters. And I believe this is the last launch of the year from Florida. So um, the statistics also say that the, there were 31 launches out of Florida. 28 were SpaceX. So that's 90% of the market. Although, to be clear, that does include a lot of Starlink launches, which are sort of internal launches. There was another launch which didn't get much press. Uh, it was the Kwaizu 1A rocket launch, which was, uh, it was supposed to launch a... A commercial space mission out in China. Uh, I think this mission was GSAT, but uh, this failed. We don't know much more about it because it's China, but yes, a uh, failed rocket launch. Also, in the last uh, couple of days, Yusaka Maezawa headed home from the International Space Station and landed in Kazakhstan, where he was met by, uh, well, instead of helicopters, they were met by all-terrain vehicles, because apparently there were like low clouds which made flying helicopters uh, unacceptably dangerous. It has been an absolute joy to watch uh, him in space. He has been making lots of really cool like uh, Instagram videos, little YouTube videos um, on the space station. Uh, he, you know, we've seen him like drumming, playing the drums on a docking adapter. He showed us how to shoot time-lapse videos uh, using his iPhone, like literally just taped to the window of the ISS. It wasn't quite as simple because he had to, you know, uh, redirect cooling air because it was in the sun. All of the videos he's shown have been shot on the Russian segment of the International Space Station. Uh, but we he did, he must have had access to the rest of the station because we actually see him in a couple of other videos. There's a video released by Roscosmos showing the crews playing badminton in the International section. So, you know, I think uh, he probably just wasn't allowed to show international stuff in the videos that he was making. But yeah, he uh, landed safely and continued to smile the whole time. And I look forward to the next uh, group of tourists going to the International Space Station, which will be Axiom 1. They've had their update, uh, their, their launch date updated to February 28th. That is, um, you know, three tourists plus a participant from uh, Axiom who's... Uh, Michael Lopez, Allegra, who I 
pointed out, by the way, he has uh, quite a lot of experience. This will be the fifth different spacesuit he gets to wear, which is a very interesting one, because he not only has flown in Soyuz and Shuttle, he's performed EVAs in the American suit and the Russian Orlan suit, and now he'll get into a Dragon suit. Um, on the space station, there was also a little bit of paperwork that was important previous week. So the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module um, basically has been an orphan for a while, and it's now been officially transferred as an asset to NASA. So previously it was owned by Bigelow Aerospace, which essentially shut down in March of 2020. Now it's been transferred over, so NASA are now actually officially responsible for maintaining it and its very hard job as a storage closet on the International Space Station. Bigelow couldn't make a business out of their uh, inflatable modules. And, you know, there's a lot of arguments that was probably due to their mismanagement. Most of the patents that they actually acquired from NASA have since expired and other companies are making inflatable modules a big part of their commercial LEO destination program uh, proposals. There was a really cool bit of video shared uh, by Elon Musk showing the Raptors at the bottom of the booster and showing them testing their thrust vector control, like showing the complete range of motion. It's strangely hypnotic. I, everyone's like, I want to look inside those boosters. That's an ITAR thing, but no, don't worry. Yeah. This, you know, Starship and super heavy development, of course, have continued. I know there's a lot of channels where you can watch every single change that happens. And, you know, more power to those guys. I can't keep up. Uh, but both vehicles, Starship and the Booster, have seen a lot of changes. New skirt uh, changes, um, you know, new greebles and stuff, hardware stuck on the side, which all have very important functionality that I've just forgotten to go into right now. We've seen changes to Starship's heat shield. Uh, which, you know, the, applying the heat shield quickly and reliably is one technical problem they absolutely have to solve. And it seems that they add, they take off the tiles, add new ones, and then there's a bunch of red tape showing that they didn't put these ones on correctly or they broke. Also, incidentally, Austin Bernard, who I've used his photos before, he has since become, he's been hired by SpaceX to work on their heat shield down at Boca Chica. So, yeah, his account's gone all quiet, but yeah, I, I think it's kind of fascinating to watch. Oh, yeah, by the way, for next week, the biggest launch, the biggest launch for a very long time, the James Webb Space Telescope. It had its launch pushed back from the 22nd to the 24th, so it really is going to be Christmas Eve. They had some problem with the electrical co uh, connections, but they solved that. The payload is now encapsulated fully in its fairings. The vehicle is being mated. Uh, it's going to launch, hopefully, you know, then deploy over two weeks. And about six months later, it should be fully operational. You know, this is a monster telescope with a massive mirror. It works in the infrared, so it can look way back further in time than the Hubble Space Telescope. It can look so far back in time that it can see its original launch date. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, a little more serious. Uh, there's, I don't know if, if you remember Vector, uh, they were working on a small sat launch vehicle and uh, unfortunately went out of business. Well, now there's a whole lot of legal shenanigans going on. So this, the former CEO, Jim Cantrell, is being sued by a bunch of investors, basically saying that he used... Uh, he used Vector as a, you know, piggy bank, whatever. Like, a big part was the Vector decided to sponsor a racing team, which was also run by Jim. Um, right now, I don't know what's going to happen with that. You know, there's always a lot of legal stuff that happens during bankruptcy proceedings, so it could well be that this is a storm in a teacup. But I will point out that right now he runs Phantom, which is also building a small sat launch vehicle, or at least trying to get funding for this. And they caught flack earlier this year for posting this tweet, uh, which appeared to misrepresent this image, which was an obvious render, especially when you look at the you know, the the fact that the rocket was covering up parts of the car. This was a NASA image which they just edited. Yeah, I don't know where that's going to go there. But, you know, more launch vehicles would be good if he can get them. Um, now, historically, there's an interesting story that, that sort of came out in the last week about there's a, there's a sample container from the Apollo program which they're going to open. So... 
I don't know if you understand that the Apollo program brought back hundreds of kilos of samples from the moon, and these were brought back inside like vacuum sealed containers. I mean, obviously, it's very easy to put something in a vacuum container on the moon when it's a vacuum, you just close it up. But they were brought back, and then those vacuum sealed containers, some of them were used right away for you know science, but they understood that technology was improving, and that if they kept some of the samples aside, then technology would improve that they might be able to do new science. And there's a canister that they're going to do new science on. They're going to look at trace gases using new technology that's available. So this is a sample from Apollo 17 collected by Gene Cernan. Um, it's from like a landslip. He basically pushed in this uh, like a coring tool and he brought out like a 70 centimeter long cylindrical core, which, yeah, that is going to be opened up now and analyzed and we're going to see if there's something cool. Hopefully in the coming decade we're going to get a lot more lunar samples to play with so it seems like a good time to be closing out all those old samples. And you know if we're looking at space science in general, um, you know we've just had the, uh, the American Geophysical Union annual you know general meeting or whatever where they all all the space planetary scientists get together and they're, it's a big deal for space exploration because this is usually where they announce some of the big results. For example, Parker Solar Probe showing their evidence that they had touched the sun this year. But there was also updates which were cool from Juno, Perseverance, and many other things. So you're going to be seeing a bunch of updates from, from those stories in the next week. So yeah, I think that's a roundup. Uh, looking forward to JWST later in the week. Hope everything goes well. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.